The title is The Prayer of Desperation. And I want to tell you how it came about. A little while back in the United States, I was teaching a series of six messages on Israel, past, present, and future. And the last two messages were called Glimpses of the Future. They were an attempt to present out of Scripture what still lies ahead for Israel as they have returned to their own land. And I had come to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, which is the, the climax. It's the return of Messiah in glory. That's the climax of Israel's history. I, ha I actually have a list of 16 prophecies concerning Israel, of which 13 have already been fulfilled. And there remain only three to be fulfilled, and the last one is the return of Messiah. And I always tell people, if 13 out of 16 have been fulfilled, that's more than 80%. It is not unreasonable to expect the remaining 20% to be fulfilled. So now I'm going to read to you from Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. And these words are addressed to Jerusalem. You need to understand that. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil or your plunder will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Did you hear that? It's pretty close to happening. It could happen within a few months at any time if the United Nations made certain decisions, it would be fulfilled. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the rem remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. When Jesus went up to heaven, where did he go from? The Mount of Olives. And two angels told the disciples, this same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He went from the Mount of Olives, he went in the clouds, he's coming back in the clouds and his feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives and there is going to be a great earthquake and the mountain is going to be divided into two, half going north and half going south. Now I spent my last year of military service in a British hospital on the Mount of Olives at a point which I believe is the exact point where the, the mountain will be divided because it's an earthquake area. There was an earthquake there in 1923 which so severely damaged one of the towers of the building that nobody is allowed up here. So for me, this is extremely vivid. I can almost see it in my mind's eye as I talk about it. Now sometimes the Lord speaks to me while I'm speaking to people. And here I was preaching this message, but something was going on in my mind. And it was this, in a sense, if the Lord intends to intervene on behalf of the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem, why will he let half the city go into captivity? The houses be plundered and the women raped. Why wouldn't he do it? before that happened. And this was going on in my mind while I was preaching it. And I thought I got the answer because the Lord will not intervene until his people have reached a moment of total desperation. When they come to the point where they know there is absolutely no other hope and no other source of help but God and the Messiah, then he will intervene. And I saw that as a, as a principle, that many times God will not intervene until we come to the point of desperation. That's what salvation is. Salvation is taking advantage of the only hope that you have of escaping from hell. There is no other way of escape but to turn to Jesus who died on your behalf. And if you don't take that, you're lost. And dear friends, I want to say to you tonight, 
That's what salvation is. It's the only way of escape from a lost eternity. From something so terrible that the human mind cannot even comprehend it. And there is no other way. And you don't know, none of you know, none of us know how much longer we may have. God could withdraw the breath from your body tonight. You might never awake to see the new day. Friends, it is urgent. It is desperate to get saved, to escape hell. Not many people talk about hell today, but hell is very, very real. And it's very close. You just close your eyes in death yeah. and you find yourself in hell. There are certain things that God will only do when we come to the moment of desperation. And there came to my mind in that connection Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah the 30th chapter and reading verses 18 and 19. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And that therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. The Lord is waiting till he can have mercy on you, till we meet the conditions. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For the people, that's Israel, shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer. What is he waiting for? The sound of our cry. And I think you'll find the NIV says your cry for help. The Hebrew word sa'aka means a desperate call for help. It's the shout of a man who's drowning and going down for the third time. And he cries out, help. And God is waiting for his people to come to that point. And then I was led to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now this is amazing because before Israel ever entered the land of Canaan, Moses told them all that would happen to them. And he told them that they would be unfaithful to God, turn to idolatry and ultimately driven out of the land and spend many, many years in exile. God told them all that before they ever went in. And here is some of what God says concerning the final crisis in the history of Israel. Now I want to say I don't believe that the church is Israel. The church is the church and Israel is Israel. And if you ever get confused, you'll be confused for a long while. But God's dealings with Israel as a nation are a pattern of the way he deals with other nations and with individuals. So there are countless lessons to learn from God's dealings with Israel. And here is what Moses told Israel as they were gathered on the east side of the Jordan just before they went over. In Deuteronomy 32 verses 23 through 27, God has already told them that they're going to go into idolatry and be totally unfaithful. And then he says, and these are terrible words, I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows upon them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence and bitter destruction. I will also send against them the teeth of beasts with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and virgin, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. I have said I will dash them in pieces. I will make the memory of them to cease from among men. Now listen, had I not feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is high, and it is not the Lord who has done all this. God says, for the honor of my name, I'm going to intervene, because otherwise your enemies will think that they are the ones who've brought all this disaster upon you. And then further, in verses 36 through 38, 
and it's all part of the same vision. For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants. When he sees that their power is gone and there is no one remaining bond or free. You see the same principle? God will not intervene until he sees the power of his people has gone. Then he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge, which ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise and help you and be your refuge. Then he says, now see that I, even I am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, nor is there anyone who can deliver from my hand. We have to come to see the total omnipotence and sovereignty of God and our total need of his mercy. There is no other hope for anybody here tonight but in the mercy of God. Then God goes on to say he will avenge those who've persecuted his people. And that's a very large number of people. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 43, he says, Rejoice, O nations, or Gentiles, with his people, that's Israel, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide an atonement for his land and his people. Brothers and sisters, there's something in the heart of every one of us that cries out for justice. And often we look at the situation in the world and we say there isn't any justice. People get, with all, get away with all sorts of crimes. They mistreat people. They oppress people. But I want to tell you there is justice. Yes. Justice is coming. Yes. God will avenge yes. his people. Yes. He will avenge all those who've been mistreated and unjustly treated. The world is full of wickedness. Would you agree with that tonight? It's going to get much fuller yet. Iniquity is going to increase to a degree that we can hardly dare to imagine. We need to know what's God's attitude. We need to know how to respond to the increase of evil, violence, cruelty, immorality pornography, every kind of filthy, evil thing that has been increasing in this nation for the last 50 years, and I've witnessed it. It's going to go on increasing. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And you say, well, Brother Prince, you're a pessimist. No, I'm not. I'm a realist. There's a difference. I'm not a pessimist because you know what I believe? Soon and very soon, We'll see the king. I think that's the only realistic source of hope there is. Man has been trying to straighten himself out for thousands of years and his condition today is worse than it's ever been. To my way of thinking, it is totally unpractical and illogical to expect salvation from the human race. But we can expect it from God. Now let's see what God says about the wicked. And don't tell me that you've never been concerned about the triumph of injustice. You have. You've often wondered, how do people get away with what they do? Is that right? Well, in Psalm 92, God has something to say about that. Verse 7. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. That's the ultimate end of the wicked. But God says, I'm going to let the harvest ripen. You remember what he said to Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 16? He said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan, but not for another 400 years, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God waits for the harvest of iniquity to come to full ripeness. And in the earth today, the harvest of salvation and the harvest of iniquity are ripening side by side. 
That's an amazing thought. It's also an amazing thought that in the parable of the wheat and the tares, the same sun and the same rain that ripen the wheat, ripen the tares. And God is going to deal with them when the harvest comes in. And Jesus said the harvest is the end of the age. I also am impressed by the words of Jesus in Revelation 22 verses 10, 11, and 12. And he said to me, maybe that was the angel, maybe it was Jesus. Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now here are some amazing words. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And some translations say, he that is filthy, let him be still more filthy. And he that is holy, let him be still more holy. In other words, the two harvests are ripening side by side. And then Jesus says, the next words are, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So we are watching Two harvests ripen side by side, simultaneously. The harvest of salvation and the harvest of judgment. And in Revelation 14, the two harvests are described immediately, one after the other. Revelation 14, beginning at verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, Jesus having on his head a golden crown. I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and, on his and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to whom sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. But the Greek says the harvest of the earth is dry. It has to be reaped or else it will be lost. That's the harvest of salvation. And it is being reaped all around the earth today. In countries which 30 years ago had no time for Jesus, people are crying out for the gospel. The Soviet Union is one example. Other parts of East Asia are the same. This is the harvest hour. And let me tell you what God says about a son who sleeps in harvest. Do you know what he says? A son who sleeps in harvest causes his father shame. And dear brothers and sisters, if you're a child of God and you're asleep in the harvest hour, you're causing your father shame. Then we come to the next harvest. First of all the grain, then the final harvest is the grapes. Verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Notice, the harvest is not reaped until it's fully ripe. <coughs> So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is the harvest of wickedness. You know what happens in a winepress? When the grapes are gathered, they put them in one of those stone sort of basins and the people come and trample them under their feet to trample the juice out. And that's the picture of the wicked being thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God to be trampled underfoot. And it says the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. In my margin it says 184 miles. Now a lot of people interpret Revelation what would I say symbolically? I would just like to ask you this question and you don't have to answer me. Do you think this is symbolic blood? 
I don't. I think it's real blood that's being squeezed out in the winepress of the wrath of God. If you turn to Isaiah 63, you'll see a picture of the one who treads the winepress. Isaiah 63, beginning at verse 1, and the name Edom is the name for the land east of the Jordan. It also means red. And uh, the name was originally given to Esau because he was red all over. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? And Bosra is the word for the grape harvest. This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And the answer is, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? And the answer is, I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. That's a picture of Jesus judging the wicked. And in Revelation 19, it says he had a garment sprinkled with blood. And then it says, for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. There is going to be vengeance, brothers and sisters. God is a God of justice. His justice tarries, but it is absolutely sure and absolutely complete. Let's go back to Psalm 73. You know, I hear a lot of sermons and I meet a lot of preachers. I hardly hear anybody today who talks about the judgment of God. Is that true? And yet it's a very, very major section of the truth of God's word. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit when he comes will convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. How will he ever convict of judgment if we never preach about judgment? Psalm 73. Here is a man who has this problem. The unrighteous are flourishing on every hand. They're making money. They get away with crime. They know how to bribe the, the courts. And this man is appalled. And he says in Psalm 73 verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Is that true? It really is. Mostly it's the ungodly who are rich. The idea that all Christians ought to be rich is not scriptural. All Christians should have an abundant sufficiency. Yes. But riches mainly are for the wicked in this generation. Surely, now this is the psalmist's comment on the situation. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. I've been living a righteous life and what have I got to show for it? Nothing. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Some of you could say that. All day long I've been plagued, chastened every morning, and yet I've been leading a righteous life. I haven't gone along with the wicked. And then the psalmist goes on, if I had said I will speak thus, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. Don't ever talk like that because you'll undermine the faith of some child of God. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood the end. There are some things you do not understand until you get into the sanctuary of God, until you get into the presence of God and hear from God and are instructed by God directly through the Holy Spirit. And now this is his, what, he, what God showed him. Surely you set them, that's the ungodly wicked, in slippery places 
you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. God says the wealthy wicked have been set in a slippery place. And the day they die, they slip immediately into hell without any alternative. God has put them in a slippery place. I wonder if that makes you feel better. I mean, you may think, well, Christians ought not ever to talk about vengeance. Not personal vengeance, but the vengeance of God, very, very much so. And we need to warn people that God does take vengeance. The Bible says he's a God of vengeance. What I'm telling you, I believe it's straight from the Bible. Now let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. You're saying, well, why doesn't Jesus come and end all this? Why do we have to go on in this suffering and this misery and this mounting iniquity? And Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise to return, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now when it says long-suffering toward us, I think it means God's elect, his chosen ones. Because he never, the word Bible never says that no one will perish. I believe in God's election, do you? I believe God has those whom he has chosen. You know what I believe? I'm one of them. Some people have a lot of trouble because people say that the Jews are a chosen race. But brothers and sisters, Christians are a chosen yes, race. Amen. We would never be Christians if God hadn't chosen us. Jesus said to his disciples, you haven't chosen me. I have chosen you. You cannot understand the Bible unless you understand God's election. So what is the Lord waiting for? He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All whom he has chosen for himself. He will not bring final judgment till every last one has come in. And he'll wait with infinite patience. And I believe there has to be one from every tribe, kindred, nation, and tongue. And I believe there's no more urgent task for the church yes, than to reach the nations that have not Amen. been reached. Yes, because Jesus cannot come until everyone has been reached. And at least there's one member of every tribe that will stand before the throne. God the Father sees to that because it's to glorify His Son that His sacrifice has not been in vain for any nation on earth. So God is waiting. It's His mercy that is waiting. He'll tolerate wickedness that we would think incredible that God should not intervene. It's not that He's not going to judge the wicked, but He's waiting for every last one whom He has chosen to come in. Brothers, when you've been in the ministry as long as I have, you will marvel at the way God finds the ones He's chosen. I mean, He does the most amazing things to find somebody that nobody else would ever think worth looking at. But He's chosen. God will not take the, the, the fishing net in until every last one who's been chosen by God has come in. So get a different view of wickedness. See it as God's infinite mercy and patience waiting for those whom he has chosen. And then don't be too passive. Do something to help reaching the unreached. Yes, amen.